I was asked to read a poem. I had many requests. One. So I thought I'd start with a poem about nature. <clears throat> but I'd also start, thought I'd start with a little reportage, sort of depressing. Um, in Washington, there's a tradition of the Washington reporters getting together in what they call the press club and inviting political figures and being very friendly and chummy with them. I think it's a reprehensible tradition. Um, and one of them I happened to hear on the radio, our beloved Vice President Cheney appeared. And it was a very warm day in Washington and he said, well, I finally have to admit that global warming is a reality. It's called spring. And everybody, <laughs> I was just so furious that they would, first of all, invite this murderer, and second, laugh at his awful joke. Anyway, so I'll read a nature poem, a sort of nature poem. Well, I thought I'd read last night, but we had so little time. It doesn't have any particular message relating to what we're saying, but I thought I'd just read it. It's called In the Forest. In a book about war, tyranny, oppression, political insanity, and corruption, in a prison camp, in a discussion in which some inmates are trying to contend, contend with the vision of a world devoid of real significance, of existence being no more than brute violence, of the human propensity to destroy itself and everything else. Someone, an old man, presumably wise, tells of having once gone to live in a forest far in the north, pristine, populated by no one but poor woodsmen and hermits. He went there, he says, because he thought in that mute, placid domain of the trees he might find beyond the predations of animals and men something like the good. They'd been speaking of their absurd sentences, of the cruelty of so-called civilization, and the listeners imagine the old man is going to share his innocent rapture. But no, he says, no, the trees and their seeds and flowers are at war just as we are. Every inch of the soil is a battleground. Every species of tree relentlessly seeks its own ends. First, the insidious grass and shub shrubs must be conquered, so a billion seeds are deployed, hard as bullets. The victorious shoots drive up through the less adaptable weaklings. The alliance of dominating survivors grow thicker and taller, assembling the canopies beneath which humans love to loll. Yet still new enemies are evolving with new weapons. In prison camps, even the worst, in the evening, the tormented souls come together to commune and converse. Even those utterly sat by their meaningless toil, those afflicted by wounds of the spirit more doleful than any we can imagine. Even there, in that moral murk that promises nothing but extinction, the voices go on. Does it matter what words are spoken, that the evidence proves one thing or another? Isn't the ultimate hope just that we'll still be addressed and no others are too? That meanings will still be devised and evidence offered of lives having been lived? In the north, the trees and the wretched page turns and we listen and listen. It has more to do with my talk, actually, than I thought. Nature and panic. The first evidence we have of any human relations with nature other than utilitarian artifacts for hunting and fishing are the Paleolithic paintings in caves in France and Spain. Those great works of art were created over a period of 20,000 years and then stopped. We don't really know why they first began to be created, nor why they didn't continue. There's been a great deal of novel speculation lately about the paintings. One of the most interesting theories is that the image we've generally had of humans in that epoch, that they lived in small groups largely isolated from each other, is inaccurate. 
it appears that there may actually have been a large civilization stretching across southern France and into Spain, a civilization that had a definite aesthetic tradition and a rather conservative one at that. Another once seemingly self-evident notion now laid to rest is that there was perceptible progress between the various eras, eras of Paleolithic culture, that the art could be sequenced by the growing sophistication and refinement of its techniques. In truth, some of the most elegant painting and engraving is from the Chauvet Cave in France, which dates from 30,000 years ago. There subsequently followed periods of, if not more crude, than definitely less inspired work. And then the astonishing paintings of genius of Lascaux 16,000 or so years ago, and finally an, end, finally an ending, as far as we know, of the tradition. I think most of us have been tempted to play the game of trying actually to appreciate the vast number of individuals who were born and died during those uncountable millenniums, and to imagine what a single person's life would have been. For myself, that kind of daydream inevitably leads me to picture my poor ancestor living in almost constant fear of threats to life and well-being, the predators, the droughts, the erratic cold that sometimes descended and stayed for thousands of years and sometimes for reasons we still don't yet understand didn't. Nasty, brutish, and short, to quote the Hobbesian cliché. My suspicion of that person's terror probably arrives from my, arises from my having read too many books like La Guerre de Feu when I was a child and having seen too many movies about cavemen being snacked upon by saber-toothed tigers. The most recent evidence suggests, on the contrary, that people during those eras regularly lived to the age of 50 or 60, which isn't an unreasonable span, even if we hope for a few more. Were those people really that much more anxious for themselves than we are? To return to the Paleolithic paintings, there's very little evidence of anguish or dread in their subject matter and execution. The animals in them are depicted with accuracy and detail and with that breathless, breathlessly assured brushwork that could have been acquired through no other means but aesthetic dedication and love. There are almost no depictions of nature as threatening. In one painting, there's a lion, but she's treated with a whimsical humor. In another, too, someone seems to have been killed by a bison, the beginning of what some researchers suspect may have been a series of myths. The only truly malignant matters that are recorded in the caves are a few mysterious and so far uninterpreted recumbent human figures riven with what seemed to be spears. They were possibly murdered, perhaps even tortured. But generally, if the society in which these artists live was fraught with fear, it certainly isn't manifested in their work.